Hallo. Mitt navn er Ingrid Baltsersen, og jeg er leder av Palestinakomiteen i Stavanger. Vi vil sammen med LO i Stavanger og Omegn ønske dere velkommen til dette veldig spennende møtet. Og for å lede dette møtet så har vi da Kian Reme. Takk skal du ha. This meeting will be in English. Uh, and that means later on, when people want to ask questions, the questions can be asked in Norwegian. Uh, so we, we will translate for Ronnie, but in the, his speech it will be in English. And uh, basically the debate and the language of the, this evening will be in English, okay? Uh, I have been myself very active in the Palestine uh, Solidarity Movement since 1975. And when I add up, that's 41 years, so it's quite some time. And I met, uh, I did not meet Ronnie Barkan before. Uh, this is my first time, I'm very glad to have met you now. Uh, but I have met some of your colleagues among Israelis who dared to take the position of an anti-Zionist position. Uh, and I've um, listened closely to, to how they have been met in the Israeli society, but also when they go abroad and speak about uh, the Palestinian cause. And basically, that's what you are doing as well, Ronnie Barkan. He is working, just to introduce uh, very shortly, he is working with the, the uh, movement called Boycott From Within, which I understand, as I understand it, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's basically an Israeli uh, organization supporting the international and Palestinian call for boycott, the investments and sanctions. BDS. Let me just take that uh, abbreviation at once. BDS is what it's called, and very often it's just referred to as BDS, and that is the International Boycott, De Investment and Sanctions Movement. Uh, you uh, are educated uh, within uh, IT and mathematics. You have been working, and still sometimes are, I think, uh, working with uh, math and IT. Uh, but And uh, your time for the organization Boycott From Within is fully voluntary. You are here in Norway now. You are visiting several places in Norway as the, the guest of the Palestine Committee. Uh, so now, tonight, we can enjoy the fact that you are in Stavanger. Very, we're very glad to have you here. You will have the floor now for about 40 minutes. Uh, when these 40 minutes uh, are gone, uh, the, every, the audience, everybody here is invited to join with comments, criticism, questions, whatever. And then from then on, we simply have a dialogue on the issue of tonight, uh, which uh, is called democracy, not eviction. Okay, that is the introduction. I give the floor to you, Ronnie Barkan. Please give him, give him a good hand. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I think you can hear me, right? Let me just get a little water and then we can start. Now I have some ice, so you will have to wait a little. I don't want to clack while speaking. Good evening, thank you for coming. Um, as was described, I am a conscientious objector to military service. Uh, I am also a member of the Palestinian popular struggle, which is joined by a handful of Israelis and internationals, struggling mostly in the West Bank, uh, in different villages against, uh, basically for their basic rights uh, in light of harsh military occupation there. And finally, and most importantly, I'm a member of the Palestinian-led Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions campaign. And this is mostly what I would like to talk about, but there's much to be discussed. That is about my activity. But another way to introduce myself which makes it much simpler, is to simply say that I'm a privileged Israeli Jew. Now, it's not because I feel affiliated much with being an Israeli or being Jewish, but this is because it is my legal status in Israel. 
I would argue that everything that Israel is based upon, everything that is happening since the foundation of the state until this very day, is about giving privileges to people of my ethnic background and taking away the basic rights from the others. So my legal status is that I have an Israeli citizenship, but I don't have an Israeli nationality because there is no such thing as an Israeli nationality. My nationality, according to the state, is Jewish, by law. My neighbor, who is an Israeli citizen, but not among the privileged, they could have, for example, an Israeli citizenship, but an Arab nationality. So Israel recognizes, in total, over 130 different nationalities. The Ministry of Interior of Israel recognizes over 130 different nationalities, none of which are Israeli. They recognize Norwegian nationality, but not Israeli, for a very good reason. Okay, so for that reason, and for everything that the rest of this talk, Israel does not recognize its own nationality. It does not recognize its own borders. It does not recognize, it does not have a stated uh, f um, immigration policy, for example. Because any of these, especially the issue of nationality, if it did recognize an, Israel national an Israeli nationality, and that was actually also taken to the Supreme Court of Israel and discussed at length, if they would accept having an Israeli nationality, it would mean that at least on paper, there would be some basis of equality. And that goes everything that the state of Israel is about. It's not just me saying it, this is what the Supreme Court said. They said that they cannot acknowledge having an Israeli nationality because that would undermine the very character of the state of Israel, quote unquote, or it is as close to the quote as I can remember now. Um, so this is why I choose to introduce myself as a privileged Israeli Jew. And this is what I would like to talk about. Um, so being born in Israel, among, as I said, the privileged group, obviously there is a lot of brainwashing or indoctrination. Uh, we're being, we are being trained uh, to, to be soldiers pretty much from kindergarten. I see that also with my nephew and nieces, how they are being taught at school in, from kindergarten onwards, um, and without questioning too much what this is all about. Uh, but even if people do take the next step, and question what it is all about, usually they would arrive at the situation where, okay, what we are doing to the Palestinians in the West Bank or in Gaza is very bad. The occupation is brutal, obviously in violation of international law, in violation of basic human rights, conven human rights conventions, and that obviously has to end. But even that is not good enough. I remind you that just recently, uh, the director of B'Tselem, uh, which is a, a human rights organization, Israeli human rights organization monitoring violations in the occupied territories, he gave a talk at the UN Security Council, and now there is a big backlash about that. They are, the Israeli government is uh, basically trying to legislate something against uh, his activity or against such future activity, but what Hagai Alad, that director, said in a nutshell, is that the occupation, what he calls the occupation, that which started in 1967, is very bad, and he calls for some sort of an intervention from the international community in order to end that occupation. I'm all in favor, of course, because the occupation is very bad, and Palestinians live unbearable lives uh, in the West Bank and especially in Gaza, uh, and obviously this is all done in violation of international law, but that, just that is simply not good enough, because this is not the whole story. This is just the story of the occupation of 1967. What the same person, Hagai Ala, did not mention is that pretty much the same also happened before. But it doesn't serve the type of thinking of people like him who call themselves liberal Zionists. I don't know what liberal Zionism means. I think that this is a contradiction in terms and we can discuss it later. But what People who are well-meaning uh, liberal Zionists, what they want to do is to end the occupation of 67, that brutal military occupation, in order to protect what is happening inside Israel proper, or what, what, what we call Palestine 48. But what is happening inside Israel proper is just as racist, and just as discriminatory, and just as illegal, actually. So this is why I started by introducing myself the way I did, because 
whatever I said about being the privileged versus the underprivileged did not start in 1967. It started at the very foundation of the state of Israel. <laughs> so I'd like to give kind of a little brief introduction to those of you who are not totally familiar with the situation. Or, and please jump in and correct me if you feel that I'm saying something that is unacceptable. Uh, can we have the first slide? Usually I don't use graphics, but if we already have it, let's, let's. So just a little historical introduction, but I'm not doing it for the sake of history. I'm doing it for the sake of discussing what is happening today. <coughs> at the eve of the foundation of the State of Israel, at the eve of 1948, this, is, this map is 1946, um, this was pretty much the, the way that the land of historic Palestine was um, uh, allocated. You had, at most, 10% of the land owned by Jews, and the rest of it, uh, approximately 90% owned by indigenous Palestinians. Um, I'm saying at best 10% because I'm really exaggerating here. We can show that it was far less, but let's, it, it doesn't matter for our purposes. Um, what happened is that the UN partition plan, this is the UN decision that was taken. Uh, it was taken in 1947. And that, in that UN partition plan, they allocated more than half of the land, about 56% of the land, the white area, to less than half of the population, about those who owned the 10% of the land consisted of about 30% of the population. They were less than half of the population, they received more than half of the land. Obviously, the UN partition plan was not very fair. Um, also, most of these people, uh, they were newcomers to the land, they were actually colonizers who came over to take over. But given all of that, that in itself is not the main Palestinian tragedy. That was just a very unfair decision by the UN. Actually, that plan never even was never implemented. It never came into being. Because what happened is that even according to this UN partition plan, other than giving more than half of the land to less than half of the population, it stated that in that Zionist state, or what was called uh, the Jewish state, um, the, the, government, the government here would have to respect the rights of all the people of that land, regardless of race, uh, religion, gender, etc. But what those who founded that state had in mind was very different. What they had in mind back then, and what they have in mind to this very day, is what they call having a Jewish and democratic state. That, it, that is another oxymoron. There is no logical meaning to Jewish and democratic. It just doesn't stand to logic. Either you have a democracy or you don't have a democracy. Either you have equality or you don't have equality. It's that simple. But what it meant for them back then, and what it means for them to this very day, is that they, if they control the population, if they, if they have their kind of population, that they can claim they are a democracy. If I have my people, then, you know, and all my people think, think the same, then what do I care? I can be a democracy. So the very first thing that they needed was to create this basically ethnically pure state, or ethnically pure to the best of their ability, state, and then they can claim that they're a democracy, and that is exactly what happened. So the main Palestinian tragedy was not about dividing the land, which didn't make much sense. It was about the fact that those who founded that state never intended to live alongside, in coexistence, as they call it, with the indigenous Palestinian people, but from the very beginning, they intended to drive them away from there. And this is what they did. Actually, they started doing that even before the very foundation of the state. Already three months before that, three months before May uh, 48, they have uh, managed to expel, by May 1948, when they established the state, they managed to expel more than one-third of the population. More, sorry, more, yes, more than one-third of the population. Basically, they expelled about half of those who eventually were expelled. So basically, at the, end of the, at the end of the day, not this is what was founded, but actually this was the state of Israel that was founded. You can see, first of all, the difference between the partition plan and what really happened. Secondly, what we don't see on this quite famous map, 
I think I have to sit down and create a map that will actually show it properly is the ratio of population there, how ethnically pure that state was here versus here. Here, what happened is that they created their cherished Jewish majority by, by force, by driving away the indigenous people from their, la from their land. Um, about 700,000 or more people have been expelled from their homes, and about 530, 530 villages have been demolished or reoccupied. This is how the state of Israel was founded. The very next thing that happened was to make sure that those who have been expelled from there will never come back, and those who remained on their land, because obviously not everyone was expelled, will not receive the same treatment, will be denied the same rights. And that, for that very reason, I have a Jewish nationality, and my neighbor on that same spot of land would have an Arab or a Circassian or a Druze nationality, but none of us will have the same nationality. Because the very first laws that were legislated were clearly racist. There are three laws that explicitly state uh, the Jewish in the law, saying if Jewish, then certain rights and otherwise not. And to this day, we have more than 50 laws that depend on these former laws. So to this day, we have more than 50 laws that are implicitly racist. And basically, they touch on many uh, aspects of life, including the ownership of land uh, and many, many other things uh, that relate to those people who live in Israel, Jewish and democratic Israel, or as they like to call it, the only democracy in the Middle East. This is how the only democracy was founded. 19 years later also came the occupation of the green areas, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and also the Syrian Golan. And since then, to this day, we have the longest running military occupation in modern time. It's a harsh, brutal military occupation. I think you, all of you probably know about it. Um, and even then, you can see how, in fact, most of the land is being controlled by Israel with, in many ways, uh, there are settlements, for example. People think that the Jewish-only settlements there, which are obviously uh, going against international law, Geneva, Geneva Convention, and so on, um, they, people think that the Israeli settlements there, they are about a land grab. It's true, it's about a land grab, but it's more than that. It's about control. Everything that Israel does is not just about taking, about taking some land, it's also about controlling, controlling the resources of the land, for example. Controlling the, <coughs> the underground, they control both the land and the underground. So they quarry, they, 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 they take away uh, all kinds of like, um, um, what is it, minerals and, and stones and so on. Uh, if it's the occupied Dead Sea, then uh, there's, uh, they extract uh, the mud uh, that they sell here and elsewhere uh, and make a profit out of it. That's another crime in itself under international law. That's, a, that's the crime of pillage. They also steal the water from under the feet of Palestinians. So 60% of the water of the West Bank uh, mountain aquifer is being diverted into Israel. And even that which is not diverted, which the Palestinians may use, is being sold to them at overrated prices. A Palestinian who would dig a well will simply go to jail for doing that because that is illegal. Palestinians cannot tap into the water under their feet. This is owned by Israel, and it goes against Israeli law, Israeli military law. Israel in the West Bank, now longer, no longer in Gaza because it only controls the perimeter of Gaza and everything that goes in and out. Um, Israel claims that it's no longer occupying Gaza. It is in every possible way, but they are not inside. They are just on the perimeter. But here in the West Bank, they are everywhere, and they control everything, and they monitor everything. So Israel <coughs> controls things uh, using the, the settlements, using, uh, obviously, as you know, checkpoints and so on, military incursions and so on. But basically, we have to remember that it is not just about the land grab. It's much more than that. It's about control. 
It's about, for example, also denying Palestinians from having a viable anything, definitely having a viable type of resistance to that horrible occupation. So this is what is happening with the water in the West Bank. I'll just, I just want to mention something about the water in Gaza. Um, two things about the resources of Gaza. One is the water. 95% of the water in Gaza is toxic. It is not fit for human consumption. Now, this is a humanitarian crisis, but it's a politically motivated crisis. Israel decided that this should be the case in Gaza. And the situation is so dire that, according to a very recent, a re relatively recent UN report, by the year 2020, Gaza will become uninhabitable. So this is a very, very pressing issue. We have to remember that. If anything, we should be talking about Gaza. Secondly, and this relates to our talk here, Israel controls, as I said, the resources, and along them is also the, the gas fields in the, Mediterranean, in the Mediterranean Sea. So according uh, to the horrible Oslo Accords, um, Gaza fishermen, for example, should be allowed to go into the sea, into what's regarded as Gaza and territorial waters, uh, about 20 nautical miles, I think. In practice, they're allowed to go in less than three miles into the sea. Uh, and that is done for many reasons, also to make their lives difficult, but also in order to deny them access to that, I suppose. Um, we know that um, we know that there is uh, there are a lot of gas reserves, and uh, this is a big game changer because uh, they found uh, huge amounts of uh, uh, natural gas reserves uh, in this area. And um, we should ask, at the very least, whose gas is it? Who who are the stakeholders here? And secondly, we should ask, even if we do recognize that there is this differentiation between Israel and Palestine, which I don't accept, if there is a differentiation and Gazans are entitled to their strip of land, then at the very least they should be allowed to access their little um, spot there. And that in itself could be a huge change. That in itself could, could, could transform the situation around. So this is kind of about the resources and how Israel controls it. Now, why the BDS campaign? Why the BDS campaign? Why the boycott, investment, and sanctions campaign started? The BDS campaign started in July 2005. Uh, it is signed by over, by over 170 different civil society organizations, Palestinian civil society organizations, including trade unions, women organizations, uh, student organizations, and so on. And they represent all three domains of Palestinian society, meaning those under military occupation, West Bank and Gaza, those who are second class citizens inside Israel, and those who are in the diaspora, the refugees. And basically what the campaign says is that they are calling on you, on the international community, to apply nonviolent means of pressure on Israel by means of boycott, divestment, and sanctions until Israel abides by its obligations under international law and human rights conventions. What are these obligations? There are three rights that have to be met. For those who are under military occupation, they deserve to be free from that harsh military occupation, obviously. For those who are second-class citizens living under these 50 oppressive, uh, discriminatory laws and so on, they deserve to have full equality. And those who have been expelled from their land and after 70 years still yearn to go back home, they deserve to, the right to go home. That's all. I don't think it's a very radical approach. I think it's quite elementary, actually, quite basic. And out of these three, probably the most important is the last, the right of the refugees. And at the very least, because they are the majority. About 70% of all Palestinians are refugees. Some of them are refugees who, who are in Gaza or the West Bank. Gaza itself was created by Israel as a refugee camp. 
They have, the people of Gaza are refugees from Yaffa here to all the, all the Nakaba area here, and they were expelled into here. And this was carved. This is also why the shape looks like this. And they were just told, go this way. And this is how Gaza was founded, basically. There was the historic Gaza, but not that many people were living there. Most of the people of Gaza to this day are refugees, and they live in an open air prison. So the refugees, some here, some here, and most of them in the diaspora, definitely have the right to go back home. These are the demands of the BDS campaign. I don't think it's uh, too much of a radical approach. Now, since the BDS campaign started, a little over 10 years ago, I would argue that everything about the discourse is changing. The whole discussion about Israel is changing. 10 years ago, people would still talk about Israel, whichever way you look, want to look at it, uh, whether this Israel or this whole Israel, it doesn't matter. People would still talk about Israel as the only democracy in the Middle East, even though it's not a democracy and never was a democracy, not even to begin with. Today, more and more people, even in top officials, are discussing, at least behind closed doors, whether Israel is an apartheid state, whether it is actually implementing the crime of apartheid. They are definitely not even questioning whether Israel is an occupying party, occupying state, whether it is a colonizing state. That is obvious. They know it. Maybe they don't want to act upon it, but they know. And the whole discourse about Israel has been changing. Now, that was done thanks to this insistence on, at least in not my interpretation of things, this was done thanks to this insistence on these three fundamental rights. The ending of the occupation, equality, and the rights of the refugees. If we only demanded the end of the occupation, like that guy that I mentioned before, um, then we would only demand the end of the occupation of these the end of the occupation of the West Bank in Gaza, which is important, but it's simply not good enough. Because also those liberal Zionists, so-called liberal Zionists, they really want to end the occupation of the West Bank in Gaza, but for, not for the sake of Palestinians, not at all. They want to end the occupation of the West Bank in Gaza because they are really concerned about their cherished Jewish majority. And today, as we speak in the whole of historic Palestine, we have a situation of a balancing now about 50-50 between Jews and non-Jews on that land. And I'm not even counting the refugees in the diaspora. So those liberal Zionists are very much concerned about how will the world look at us. We claim that we are a democracy, a Jewish democracy, but now we are controlling this whole thing. They say well, they don't want to control it, but they do control it at the moment. There is a, about a 50-50 ratio at the moment. Soon, even according to their logic, they can no longer claim that they are a democracy if the minority will control the majority. So they are desperate to get rid of that military occupation for their sake, in order to justify what is happening in their cherished ethnic supremacist state. And then, you know, there's all kinds of uh, fighting about how do we do that? What is the best way to do it? And they also fight with... Uh, so-called Palestinian representatives in Ramallah about how to do that as well. You know, they say they also have their demands to the Palestinians about, you know, how much land they should give away and so on. As if Israel has any claim to that land. You know, like any military occupying power, they have no rights to the land and they have full obligation to the people there. Just like the U.S. Have full, has full obligation to the people of Iraq, you know, obviously what they do is something very different. So, so we have to remember, and this is why I mentioned the liberal Zionists, not only to, to say that I don't like them, also in order to, to put it in perspective, simply ending the occupation is not good enough. Whenever we want to discuss a solution to the Zionist-Palestinian conflict, we have to discuss all three rights that are stipulated in the BDS campaign. Not only ending the occupation, but also demanding equality, and that means a huge transformation inside Israel proper and the rights of the refugees. Then and only then, Israel may become a legitimate state. From the Israeli perspective, they will say that this will be the end of Israel. 
it will be the end of ethnic supremacist Israel. It can also be the beginning of something that is sane and legitimate and respects the rights of all the people of that land, just like the UN partition plan wanted in the first place. You know, even if we accept that there will be two states, I'm not a big fan of two states, but even if we accept a situation where there are two states in the long run, then both states will have to respect the rights of all. We cannot have one democratic state for Palestinians and then another supremacist state for the privileged uh, Israeli Jews. That's, that's not acceptable. But that is what we are being offered by every single liberal Zionist out there. This is the type of two-state solution that they want. But it's no solution at all. If we do want to have two states, it will not be according to the Oslo Accords, it will be two democratic states that respect the rights of all. And first and foremost, the rights of the refugees. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and then you can say, okay, but Israelis don't want that. I also don't think that many people, many white people in apartheid, in apartheid South Africa wanted to end apartheid, but they did, not of their own accord. They didn't wake up one day and say, you know, maybe it's not such a good idea, maybe we have to end it. Things changed and eventually the situation changed. Also the, the fall of the Soviet Union and so on. Anyway, and, and many other things, and a very strong BDS campaign. And eventually, after many, many years, when the whole world was boycotting apartheid South Africa, other than two countries, Israel and the US, Israel was arming South Africa to its teeth, and uh, the late arch-criminal Shimon Peres and the Nobel Peace Prize laureate uh, tried to sell new Israeli nuclear weapons to South Africa during apartheid. He was responsible for arming South Africa to its teeth. Um, so, so other than Israel and the US, the rest of the world was boycotting South Africa. We are not there yet with Israel, but we have definitely come a long way in the past 10 years <coughs> to the extent that today the BDS campaign is becoming a worldwide awareness movement and people are joining it by the day, and we have, um, I'll give you just a few examples. Um, 10 years ago, uh, they started with this thing called Israeli Apartheid Week, one week of um, events, activities on campus, in uh, one campus in Toronto, Canada, uh, where they had uh, lectures and movies and so on about the situation in Israel-Palestine. 10 years later, we have over 200 campuses holding this week-long event around, uh, it's around February, March each year. Uh, and, and it is growing uh, every year. Uh, there is a very big transformation happening in North America where even among the Jewish society there, American Jews who are traditionally uh, raised to be Zionist, and blindly support the state of Israel, we see a huge shift these days where they are, at the very least, distancing themselves from Israel. And the, the, uh, the quantity, the percentage of, of uh, Jewish activists, you know, Jewish by religion or ethnicity or whatever, Jewish activists among the BDS campaign is, is enormous, especially in the US. The, the leading uh, Jewish movement there uh, in the US is a uh, JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace, which has multiplied its volume by, by at least by five uh, in the past years. Um, they have surpassed, not by uh, uh, donations, but they have surpassed by, by volume uh, organizations like APAC and so on there in their number of uh, members. Um, and actually they have adopted the BDS campaign uh, in its totality, um, and they did that after years that they have already been on board. They have already been doing BDS work and speaking the BDS language. But even that was not enough to their members. And they said, though, though those members of JVP, they said, we need you to explicitly support BDS. You are not, we need you to take the next step. We need you to take a step further. So, so this is very interesting that initially, uh, the director of uh, JVP and so on felt that we, they don't want to, you know, to take to go too far, 
And eventually what happened is the opposite. The people were demanding that change. So this is uh, a very interesting thing that is happening in the US. Obviously, on American campuses, we see a lot of BDS activity taking place. This is kind of the thing to do. Uh, and also, obviously, not only in the US. So I am very optimistic about it because we have managed to come a long way in the past 10 years from transforming the whole discourse about Israel, from having real concrete actions and also real concrete successes about uh, BDS, uh, even in front of multinationals like uh, Veolia, which is uh, a large company dealing with waste management and so on, uh, with um, which another one, G4S, which is the, which is a Dutch uh, British company dealing with security and. Uh, for their involvement in Israeli violations, uh, they have had eventually to cave in because there was such a pressure from people around the world. Because they were losing so many contracts, they had to cave in and eventually step away. I don't know if something is making a noise here. Uh, step away from um, their involvement in Israel. Now, maybe one final thing and uh, I'm happy to, to have a discussion. I didn't want to, to speak for too long. Uh, we can have as much of a discussion. Um, maybe one last thing is about, <coughs> sorry, um, is about sort of a little bit about being an Israeli dissident. Um, so I mentioned that the so-called Israeli left is not so much what I would call left. They are concerned about ending the occupation for their own selfish interests. And the others, the dissidents, those who are anti-Zionist and support all Palestinian rights are very few. At the same time, we're being quite vocal compared to the numbers. Uh, and also Israel is showing, is exposing itself uh, by, uh, for example, legislating a law. Uh, so five, six years ago, they legislated an anti-BDS law. Uh, saying that pretty much whatever I just said today is illegal. Um, uh, basically, anyone calling for a boycott for political reasons, uh, that is, uh, goes against that law. So they, they will not send me to jail, but they can sue me for a lot of money. Even though this was legislated over five years ago, it was never implemented. They never took anyone to court for that. Because, I think, because they understand how bad that makes Israel look. Legislating such a law it goes directly against uh, freedom of speech and political organizing and so on. And actually, one of the main critics of that law when it was legislated was the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League in the United States, which is very Zionist and right-wing, because exactly for that reason, because they understood how bad that makes Israel look. And this is what we are seeing over and over today, where more and more, there are more and more expressions by the Israeli government, the right-wing Israeli government, um, which is really far from being subtle. Uh, for that speech by uh, Chagai al Ad, the head of uh, B'Tselem in the, at the UN, they suggested to strip him of his citizenship. They suggested to legislate a law uh, against uh, such calls for sanctions against Israel, even though there was already a law that was put in place five years ago. They want to even expand it and so on. They are really Exposing, exposing themselves for what they really are. And basically, we see that towards the society in Israel, towards Israelis, conscientious Israelis who speak up against Israeli crimes, they are trying to suppress it by law and so on. And they also do pretty much the same around the world. They are trying to work together with local governments and local organizations to make it also illegal for you to, to speak up to speak your mind against Israeli crimes. Uh, they are trying to accuse anyone who is speaking against uh, Israel as being an anti-Semite, for example. Not because it has any merit, actually. There's, no, there's nothing in that accusation. BDS is uh, explicitly anti-racist. I mean, we are, um, we are very clearly opposed to anti-Semitism, just as much as we are opposed to Zionism. Um, but that accusation, false accusation of anti-Semitism is, is simply done because this is the, the last thing in their ars arsenal. 
the only thing that they have is this and using brute force. So we have to remember that the reason that Israel is using more and more this type of approach by legislating against people and accusing everyone who dares to speak up their mind of anti-Semitism and so on is simply because they, have, they, they, are, they are losing the battle. And this is <laughs> a reason for optimism. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but, but it is a good sign. The way that they are acting shows how desperate they are because they cannot speak that language of rights and, and, and so on. We, we have, other than that brute force, other than nuclear weapons and so on, everything else is on our side. Truth, justice, equality, and so on is on our side. So we don't have to be ashamed to speak up. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting introduction. And I must say that uh, I was brought back to my early days in the Solidarity Movement uh, in the sense that we were calling then for a secular democratic state mm -hmm. in Palestine. Mm -hmm. And this was also the slogan of the PLO at that time. Yeah. Uh, a secular democratic state in, in Palestine for all, one state and calling for the re refugees, the right of, of the refugees to return, for equality in Israel, and to end occupation. Yeah. Uh, now, um, my critical question, I think simply I'll start with the critical question, and, uh, and then we, I will give the floor to anybody else who wants to, to question you. Uh, what we have seen is that the PLO has changed their mm -hmm. position. Uh, the Oslo Accords, and even before that, we have seen that the PLO, uh, where we were always struggling in the streets, even in Stavanger, to, to call for the recognition of the PLO as a sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people, they said that, okay, we can make a deal with Israel, we uh, want you to end the occupation. Uh, they, they, um, uh, to me, it seems like they have taken the position of the liberal Zionists. Uh, then it's also more difficult for the solidarity movement. If, if you're the people you are going to try to sh so show solidarity with uh, are only asking for that, why should we uh, call for something more? So this is one dilemma which I think that the Solidarity Movement, I think the Palestine Committee and also the other movements in Norway have, have had discussions about this. How do we deal with it? Uh, and also one question about uh, apartheid. Uh, I think that uh, the, the comparison is, is very fair. I mean, there is obviously uh, very many comparisons between apartheid South Africa and the apartheid practiced in, in, the, in Palestine. Uh, even in some cases, you will find that the Israelis had worse, I mean, administrative detentions in South Africa were three months, I think, while in, in, in Israel, they, on the Palestinians, they have six months and so on. So you will find cases and elements where even the apartheid of the Israelis are worse than the old uh, South African apartheid. But still, one very important reason, according to my uh, mind, for why the, the, uh, the world were able, together with the ANC, to bring down the apartheid state of South Africa was the fact that there was a, there was a strict call from the ANC. They continued their armed struggle at the same time as they called internationally for a BDS. Mm -hmm. Now, again, that really was a, a very uh, successful <laughs> receipt for how to, to make really big changes. Here, we do not have an ANC. We do not have a PLO making this call. Uh, and there, in fact, what we see now in the West Bank is a self government, uh, the, the administration, the Palestinian administration, are more, in many cases, doing the job for the Israeli occupation. Exactly. So then we have other conditions related to Palestine, and how do you think, as you know, a BD, with a BDS mind, how does this affect the possibilities to bring about real changes in, in Palestine? Okay, great. So thank you. Um, 
I absolutely agree uh, that it makes it more difficult because there is no proper Palestinian leadership. What is the Palestinian leadership? Is that the one that the EU recognizes? Obviously, obviously not. I mean, they are not even elected. They lost their uh, mandate long ago since Gaza is under siege. Um, this is why Gaza is under siege, because <laughs> the, the wrong people got elected. Um, but at the same time, I would argue that the most representative Palestinian body today, or the most representative view of Palestinians today, is the BDS call. As I mentioned, it is signed by over 170 different organizations um, that represent also the, all the domains, all the formations of Palestinian society. So even though there is no proper leadership, and that is a very big success of the Zionist. OK, yes, I will use that. OK. So even though there is no uh, proper leadership, I would argue that the best type of leadership that we have today is the BDS campaign. Without arguing about, <clears throat> without arguing about who should be leading that campaign. Secondly, the discourse that the BDS campaign offers is a sort of really setting the ground for everything else. So. When, for example, Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, says, and he said it several times, that he will be willing to renounce the right of return if the Israelis offer him a good deal, then basically this is not up to him to decide. The only right that he can renounce is his own personal right to return to Safed, where his family is from. But he cannot speak on behalf of any other Palestinian who wishes to go home if they do wish to go home. Um, so when we speak this discourse of, 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 of rights, we basically, um, and we insist on these three fundamental rights as one consolidated demand, we manage to overcome all these different things that separate the different factions and so on, because each faction has their own views and their own style and so on. But and not to mention that the whole question of one state or two state and so on. So being smart about it, we don't go into it. I don't care if it's one state or two states or five. I care, but it's not the main issue. I am also active in the one state uh, discourse along with our friend Uri Davis and so on. But I am putting this uh, as a, um, this is a side issue, not the main issue. The one state discourse offers us a, a vision of how do we want to move forward, what do we wish to see. But our demand is not to have a one state, our demand is to have the three rights. So it's not about how many states, it's about how many rights. When we put it this way, then we manage to overcome the different uh, problems, the different obstacles on the way. The PLO indeed was in favor of one secular democratic state in the past. And unfortunately, they changed their ways, or at least some of them. I don't want to blame everyone, but uh, <coughs> definitely what happened in the past is not what they represent today. Uh, and I am not in a position to, I am critical of them, but in context of the rest of the story, uh, I don't want to focus on them, first of all, because uh, it's definitely not my role it is the role of Palestinians to criticize them. And secondly, also because I don't want to take away from uh, the main culprits here, the main ones who are uh, responsible. So we have to remember that living under this harsh occupation where Israel, it's one of the Israel's greatest successes is its divide and conquer policy. And one example of that success is what they did with the uh, Palestinian leadership. Um, they have also managed to separate among Palestinian society in many other ways, <coughs> separating between West Bank and Gaza. You know, people in the West Bank don't necessarily show solidarity with the, their, sometimes their even families in Gaza. People inside 48, what's called Israel proper, they have been uh, less sort of depoliticized, and now there is kind of this re 
emerging uh, um, you know, phenomena and discourse that is more political and more standing for their rights. So, so Israel did quite a good job at divide and conquer, and that also, we can see the result of that also with the Palestinian leadership. So the BDS campaign is also sort of a galvanizing force undoing basically what Israel did with its uh, very successful, unfortunately, divide and conquer policy. Now about apartheid, apartheid South Africa is not like apartheid, it's not exactly the same as apartheid Israel, we all know that. Uh, definitely not in the sense of what's called petty, ap petty apartheid. Uh, these uh, clear examples of uh, black and white people cannot share the same uh, bench on the park or go to the same restaurant or to the same beach. There is none of that in Israel. There is, by the way, a lot of segregation which is done not necessarily by law but in practice. There's many ways to segregate the population. Instilling fear, uh, simply having different institutions, dealing with different things. For example, the educational system, it's totally segregated. Not only between Arabs and Jews, also between different types of Jews. By the way, when I say Jews, I always have to say it's ethnic Jews, it's not about religious Jews. Zionism has nothing to do with Judaism, it's about ethnicity, it's not about religion, we can talk about that. But, but also in the, in the, even um, in the Israeli Jewish educational system, there are different types of schools. The secular system, the more religious, the very religious, we never interact. Definitely not with the non-Jews. So, so there is a lot of that, but not by law. What definitely exists by law and what I refer to as apartheid, and, and I mean the legal definition of the crime of apartheid as defined in the Rome Statute, is a whole system, a legal system, that is all about uh, privileging one ethnic or racial group, in our case it's an ethnic group, at the expense of the others by discriminating, by denying, some of which are very basic rights, including, for example, I mentioned the uh, land ownership, including, obviously, if it's about the refugees, denying them the right to come back home. That's a very serious uh, uh, problem. That, that's a very serious uh, right that is being uh, taken away from them, and so on. So um, <clears throat> I think, I'm, no legal, I'm not a legal scholar, but I, I am pretty sure that uh, for what I have read and what I have discussed with others, that Israel does fall under the legal definition of the crime of apartheid. And even if not, this is something, I mean, I, I think it does, but, but this is something that has to be discussed. We don't have necessarily have to make the comparison with apartheid South Africa. We just have to stick to the definition of it under international law. That's good enough. Besides people who were active in South Africa, who have suffered apartheid there, have seen the situation in Israel-Palestine and they have said that from their experience, the situation in Palestine is far worse. So I also have to take their word for it. But, but I agree that it's not the same and I absolutely agree with your feedback. Okay, then uh, the floor is open for people who want to comment or ask questions. Oh, okay, um, thanks for a very interesting talk, actually. Uh, it was a very nice summary of, of the situation of the Palestinians and, and their rather bad situation. Uh, in a couple of weeks' time, there is an election of a new president of the United States. Mm -hmm. and the likely winner, of course, Clinton, has already been out there uh, announcing that she will uh, work against any sort of measure that puts the state of Israel under pressure. Yeah. And she has also said that she actively would work against the promotion and the further work of BDS movement. That's what I remember from an interview with her. Um, obviously, <coughs> my own opinion is that to get a solution to this problem, it has to happen through the world communities, bodies like the United Nations. It has proven in the past it's less effective, these agreements between the parties as we talk about. And my question to you then is, in view of the fact she will likely be the president, uh, 
how do you think that will impact the further work of the BDS and the work towards a final and hopefully happy solution for the Palestinians and the Israelis? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I will add to that, first of all, that we also know, according to the WikiLeaks, uh, you know, the DNC uh, emails and Hillary's emails, uh, that uh, about her sort of um, dealings around BDS or her discourse, her language being used behind the scenes uh, about BDS. And at the very least, I can say that she's concerned. And definitely her funders are concerned about BDS. That's a good sign as far as I'm concerned. Um, if they did nothing about BDS, then I will be worried. If they didn't legislate laws, if they didn't care about us, but they do care about us, there is a whole ministry in Israel, the, the uh, Gilad Erdan, the, the minister, <coughs> he is the minister of internal security and in Hebrew it's Hasbara, which is propaganda. In English they translate it into a minister of, in, of information. Okay, his head, the director of his ministry is the former chief military censor. That tells you something. The censorship in Israel, I'm a little digressing, but maybe it's important. The censorship in Israel is very strong, but people don't know about it. For example, in, the, in an interview that that lady did just before she stepped out of her position as the censor, she said, for example, that for the eight o'clock TV news, at six o'clock there's already a representative of the censorship going through the lineup of each uh, channel, of each uh, news, uh, okay, news desk. Um, she also talked about other things. So basically, um, um, many things, by the way, when the, censor when th the censorship does intervene, the body, the, the, the newspaper and so on, is not even allowed, not only that they're not allowed to, to um, inform of certain information, they're not even allowed to inform that there was any intervention in their article. So it's all done kind of hush-hush, behind the scenes. That type of approach is also now being implemented with the ministry that is responsible for tackling BDS. I don't like it, but I think it's a good sign. Okay, they are using, what I said before, they are using brute force. They are using their, the best, to their ability, the best uh, ways to silence, to suppress, etc. Hillary will be doing the same, I suppose. I can only assume it's not going to be fun, but it is reassuring. We don't have to be afraid of that. Um, especially, and this goes to, to the other thing, you said about how do we bring about a solution, and uh, obviously the UN, for example, uh, should be doing much more. I agree with that. Because the UN and other international bodies, like the EU, are not doing what they are obligated to do by law, it is up to us, or down to us, the people, to speak up. So I see BDS as a sort of from, as a grounds up, uh, uh, sort of a grassroots type of organization, that we have boycott, that is something that every one of us can do. Then we have divestment, which is if you're already invested in a certain company, or if your pension fund is invested in a certain company and that company is acting in violation of international law and so on, please approach your pension fund, approach the university, approach whichever body it is that is invested and tell them please pull out your money from that, um, from that company that is acting in violation of international law and invest in a socially responsible way. SRI, socially responsible investments, is a, is a field that is picking up pace these days. For example, you have the state-owned uh, NAMO factory, right? That is supplying uh, uh, the weapons that are being used uh, in Gaza. Uh, that is something that should be considered as, you know, whether you can somehow divest from there. So we have boycott, something that everyone can do. Divestment, if you're already invested, please make sure that it is invested in the right way. Finally, there's sanctions. Sanctions is not something that you and I can do, it's something that an international body can and should do. The UN definitely has many reasons to intervene, to sanction, and so on, Israel, because of its numerous violations of international law, human rights conventions, 
even decisions by the UN itself that has been uh, basically flagrantly um, um, dismissed and so on. Also the EU, that's another example. The EU, uh, the EU-Israel Association Agreement, the trade agreement between the EU and Israel, has a binding clause, Article 2 of the agreement, says that if there is a consistent human rights violation in Israel, then the whole uh, agreement is void. And then the EU ha can, if they wish, take some corrective measures. They can freeze the agreement, they can sanction, they can try to do other things. But what they cannot do is carry on doing business as usual with Israel. What they choose to do, every member state of the EU chooses to look the other way and violate their own European laws and their own agreements that they have signed upon in order to protect Israel. So, so that's why I'm saying they are not doing what they are obligated to do. So it's up to us. If they did what they're obligated to do, Israeli apartheid will not be able to carry on by itself. It is not self-sustained. It is very much dependent. Because it is very much dependent, it is also very much susceptible. Once we intervene, once we say, uh, BDS doesn't have uh, financial power. I mean, let's say we are super successful and we manage to, let's say, bring down some five, 10 very big companies that are involved in Israel and you know, we, they either collapse or they just pull out their investments from Israel. That will not change much of the Israeli economy. That will definitely not in itself bring down apartheid, occupation, and so on. But what the BDS does is not only the financial aspect of it, it changes the whole discourse. It changes the whole way that Israel is being perceived in the world. And the whole uh, status of Israel, the whole standing of Israel is changing and it is plummeting. Israel is regarded more and more as the pariah state that it is. That is something that Israel is very concerned about. So it's not tangible, but it is happening. The brand of Israel is very important and it is plummeting. And um, yeah, and I can only say that this is happening and, and this, is, this is what we are working on basically. I mean, I, what we're working on is to, to realize Palestinian rights, but, but by speaking about Palestinian rights, we're exposing what Israel does and it's not necessarily targeting the Israeli economy, it's targeting the, the, the uh, you know, the, the the, yes, uh, what, w what would be the right word, you know, like the, uh, the, the, the title, the brand of Israel, yes. I think I can take a question in Norsk, because I feel more comfortable with the language there. In the following Norsk-Israel handelskammer, so the handel between Norge and Israel is 30% in 2015. In the last month, so was the Norsk Olje and Energy Minister Tord Lien in Israel with a strong Norsk delegation, mainly from the University of Stavanger and from NTNU in Trondheim. The goal is that Israel will use Norsk competence for att bygga upp en industri som kan utvilja olje och gas från källor som är på, på ockuperat område. Mitt spörsmål är om det finns krafter i Israel som jobbar för att göra känt det att Israel faktiskt gäller olje och gas från områden som är, 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 är ockuperat land och havområde och som är i strid med folkrätten. So the forces in Israel that are acting about these issues are speaking about the theft from the Israeli public and privatizing uh, the petroleum industry. And Israel has privatized many things. It has privatized the Dead Sea, for example. The owners of the Dead Sea are no longer the state of Israel, even though this is actually a world heritage, uh, according to UNESCO and so on. Um, the owners of the Dead Sea, and they can do with it whatever they, as, as they see fit, is the, the company that is uh, the Dead Sea factories. They can do whatever they want with it and they are basically destroying the Dead Sea. The same Israel also did with the uh, um, petroleum industry and, the, and they have privatized it and they have done all sorts of dealings that are pretty, pretty surely illegal. 
And this is what the Israeli public is concerned about. They are not concerned about the stealing of the resources from Palestinians or from the occupied Syrian Golan Heights, where they're also stealing from there. Uh, but, and, and I think our job is to, to raise that discourse that is not being discussed. So they are only discussing one angle, which is important, about the privatization. They are not discussing whose, I mean, the moment that they discuss the privatization, they are raising, to a certain degree, the question of whose resources are these. But those who are raising that question assume that it is only their Israeli um, resource and not all the people of that land, all the stakeholders, those who are on the land and those who have the right to come back home. So it is our job to, to raise that. And I think that uh, I'm not I don't know enough about the forces that are acting here. Uh, I know that there is definitely strong cooperation now with Israel and Norway about um, extracting uh, petroleum, uh, natural gas in this case. Um, I know that also the chief scientist, according to uh, some recent uh, talk that the Israeli ambassador gave about a, a month ago, he said that the chief Israeli scientist is coming here I think, to stop and go to, for a meeting. Uh, you have to monitor uh, if he's coming, you know, maybe you can do a little uh, show, a little demonstration. Um, and, and they are definitely going to invest a lot in that, and we are talking about, obviously, uh, a lot of money at stake. At the same time that there is a lot of money at stake, there is a lot of illegality go uh, at stake as well. <laughs> so um, I don't... We have to. We need to have uh, some sharp legal people here, kind of uh, people who understand the law and to understand exactly about the illegalities here and to raise that to awareness of the different bodies. Because I don't think that different municipalities, for example, would want to to participate in something that is clearly can be shown that is clearly illegal. Um, but unfortunately, I cannot elaborate more than that because uh, we just have to research it. But uh, I think you are in a very good position to do that. Just like we have to do our share. Uh, I think that here there is a... Uh, uh, just an information also that you, you might be interesting for mm -hmm. you, uh, Ronnie, that is that also in the Norwegian government there is a kind of a split on this. Because the Minister of, of Energy goes to Israel and uh, promotes Norwegian company uh, uh, cooperating with Israeli companies on exploiting gas. Yes. While our foreign minister was asked about this in parliament for uh, some two years ago. And the foreign minister answer was that he said this, I'm not talking about Israel specifically, I'm talking about in general. The Norwegian state, the Norwegian government uh, does not uh, will not encourage any Norwegian company to be involved in cooperation on, on, uh, on uh, utilizing these resources unless all the border issues and you know, the neighboring states and all these things, they have to be resolved before the Norwegian government will support or endorse such uh, cooperation. At the but very still, least, still the, the Minister of Energy goes down there, and still yeah. he promotes it. So it, there is yeah. a there is a, a, a there's a split in the Norwegian government on that uh, issue. Yeah, there is a real question here about Israel doesn't recognize its own borders, and that that puts in question. Uh, I mean, because even from the financial aspect, uh, the borders are very important here to realize whose territory this is uh, when they extract. Um, gas. Now, Israel doesn't recognize its own borders to the extent that when I go uh, to pick up my niece from the kindergarten or the school and so on, in the kindergarten and in the school, the Ministry of Education doesn't recognize Israel's own borders. They have a map. None of the maps that you saw here, they just have the whole territory as being Israel. So this is what the Israelis think about Israel, and this is also what the Israeli government thinks about the borders of Israel. One more question here. Um, I have a question uh, more on, on like um, 
how is it to be an anti-Zionist activist? Will you tell some stories about your niece and uh, how people are taught to be soldiers from an early age? So can you talk a little bit more? Do you get any information about uh, alternatives? <laughs> And also, uh, do you know how it is for the uh, uh, Israeli Arabs or for the Palestinians that live in 48? Yeah. So um, could I ask you for the other slides, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think that, first of all, we are uh, indoctrinated from very early on. Thanks. Uh, indoctrinated from very early on, from kindergarten. Uh, and. Uh, there is a, this subtle, subtle form of brainwashing, um, but it is a brainwashing that everyone believes in. No one thinks that they are being brainwashed. But, but basically, I would say that Israelis are simply trained to believe that they are surrounded by enemies, that they are the ones who are protecting themselves, um, and, and basically everyone else is out to, to destroy us, to kill us, to drive us away and whatever. So it's kind of this, uh, you know, the victimizers are feeling themselves as being the victims and this is kind of what they believe. Um, this goes along directly with Zionism itself because Zionism from the very beginning uh, was a nationalistic movement, an ultra-nationalistic movement that uh, was created in response to anti-Semitism in Europe. But it wasn't just a reactionary response to, to it wasn't just a reaction to, to anti-Semitism. It, it is based on anti-Semitism and thrives off anti-Semitism. It is, it's only justification to this day is this notion that the other people hate us. So, and I can elaborate about that if you want, but basically I'm just giving you kind of the, the bottom line is that to this day, another reason that they accuse everyone who is against the state of Israel, anyone who is critical of the state of Israel, they accuse them of being an anti-Semitic, it's because that's kind of the type of thinking behind it in the first place. It wasn't just that they wanted to build something that is sort of kind of protecting themselves from anti-Semitism. They have created this identity that is based on the outside disliking us and all the time the only way to justify their own existence is to say you know they don't like us so we have a right if the other people don't necessarily hate us not necessarily there's such a good reason for zionism and for, uh, to carry on okay but at the same time that i'm saying that what is clearly happening is that israelis live at the expense of Palestinians and the very Israeli identity is based on denying Palestinian identity. So while they are saying, you know, everyone hates us all the time and everyone seeks to destroy us and so on, their very identity living, Zionist living in Palestine is done at the expense of and, and by not realizing it, but by denying any form of Palestinian identity, not, not only Palestinian existence, any Palestinian who is raising their head and demanding their rights, or even an act of Palestinian culture is regarded as some sort of a war against Zionism. So, so also from the psychological angle, uh, and again, I, we can talk about it much more, but also from the psychological angle, there is this thing uh, that Israelis depend on denying Palestinian existence, and they depend on other people sort of kind of saying, oh, you know, they hate us, so we have uh, a reason to, to, to say here. It's kind of this very weird psychological situation. So if we have this um, slide. This slide shows when we talk about apartheid and so on. This is the situation in Israel-Palestine, throughout historic Palestine. We have sort of different layers of privileges and less privileges. Starting from the top, pri people among the privileged group, like myself, who can basically travel and reside in every part other than, let's say, Gaza and uh, some parts of the West Bank, what's called Area A and B. Uh, obviously have voting rights and so on. Then you have Palestinians who are citizens of Israel and they have voting rights. I would argue that their vote doesn't really count from the political aspect. They have civil rights, but they have very little political rights. So even though they can vote for the Israeli parliament, it doesn't really mean much. 
I personally don't vote for the Israeli parliament. I don't recognize its legitimacy. I think it is an apartheid parliament and I don't care about voting there, not even to Palestinian parties. I see no point in that. I think that the best thing that they can do is simply not participate in the parliament. Uh, but those people are basically uh, reside in only certain parts, not because they don't have a freedom freedom of movement, they can, but they don't. I mean, but still, you can see that they are concentrated only in certain areas. And this is what I was talking about before about segregation and so on. It's not segregation by law, but this is what it looks like when you look at the map. And they are, at best, second-class citizens. Then you have the residents of East Jerusalem, about half a million of them. They are not citizens, they are residents. Israel claims that they have the same rights as I do, only take away voting rights. They cannot vote for the parliament, they can vote for the municipality. In practice, the situation is very different. They live in a very precarious situation where even though they have been living here in East Jerusalem for generations, they can be uh, stripped of their residency very easily. For example, if uh, someone comes to study here in the university, they can, uh, and they remain here for a few years, they can be denied the right to ever go back home. Or if someone from East Jerusalem marries uh, their spouse in uh, Ramallah, which is 15 minutes away, and they choose to live there because their spouse cannot come and live with them in East Jerusalem, and they stay there for a few years, or they base their lives in Ramallah rather than East Jerusalem, even though it is both parts of the West Bank, but it is under a different legal uh, status, then if they just move a few minutes away from there, they can lose the right to ever go back home. This, these are real stories, and there, is, there are many people who have lost their residency simply for, for legalistic issues. What Israel started by sheer force in 1948, the ethnic cleansing that started by force in 1948, has transformed itself into a legal type of ethnic cleansing. So everything now is done under the guise of the law especially in East Jerusalem, where it's very easy to strip people of their uh, rights, to demolish their homes, to do whatever they want, to arrest them, to do whatever they want, and it's all done under the guise of the law. Actually, the Jerusalem mayor boasted recently about his collaboration, cooperation with the Shin Bet, with the Secret Security Service. And he, uh, they are receiving the, the security services, uh, the Secret Security Service is giving uh, the Jerusalem municipality blacklists of political activists, and the municipality uh, basically targets these people by giving them fines, by denying them permits, and so on. This is how the system works. Also, the same Jerusalem municipality has a plan called Jerusalem 2020, which says very clearly, they are shameless about it, they say that we have to maintain a cap on the percentage of Palestinians living in the city. Just imagine any other city in the world saying we have a, to maintain a cap of the percentage of Jews living in our city. But in Jerusalem, that, that's okay, you can do that. So these are the Jerusalemites. Then you have the people in the West Bank, which are living under military occupation, which we discussed before. And the people in Gaza, who are living under even harsher conditions of military occupation. And then you have the people who are stateless, rightless, basically live in the diaspora and would like to come back home, and Israel denies them even that. So when we talk about Palestinian rights, first of all, this is the system. This is, there is no one-state solution yet, but there is definitely a one-state condition. It's just a very a condition that is very unfair and unequal. But Israel controls the whole of this. And when we talk about Palestinian rights, we have to rather than looking from the top downwards, we have to start from here, from the bottom, and look up and, and demand the rights of these going upwards. Okay, um, you asked me about, um, about um, living uh, in this condition. So, so basically, you know, the privileged people, they, they feel that they have a democracy. They don't feel, they don't see this. For us, this is flat. I mean, it feels like uh, democracy, people convince themselves that they live in the own democracy in the Middle East, 
and so on. And then there is some, some fear of the others. Uh, but, but since there is this segregation and so on, we don't even have to interact much. So it's very easy not to sim simply not to pay attention, simply not to, to live your life uh, in a way that, that you don't really have to interact. And if there is an interaction, usually it's uh, uh, only about commerce and so on. You don't really have to, to deal more than that. So I would say that for most Israelis, most Israelis are not uh, um, monsters, OK? Most Israelis are not uh, uh, just out there to kill Palestinians and so on. There are, there are quite a few who, who are uh, like this. But most of them are just apathetic. They don't care. They don't know and they don't want to know. And the system allows this to happen. They can carry on living their life without knowing pretty much anything about Palestinian uh, uh, troubles. And, and obviously the media plays uh, an important role in that. Israeli media, as I mentioned before, that there is strong censorship, but there is even stronger self-censorship in the Israeli media. The media simply doesn't want to report many things that are happening. And when they do report it, it's in a very slanted way. So they say, let's say, some Palestinian uh, is being killed in the West Bank. So they will say, according to Palestinian sources, someone has been killed, as if this is not verifiable. And then they will give another two paragraphs to the military spokesperson to basically lie through their teeth. And people would read this. They, they automatically uh, trust everything that the military spokesperson says, and they're happy with that and they carry on with their lives. Obviously, that person did something wrong and deserved to die, and that's it. They will never question it, because the system is built that way. So, so the, it's a little difficult to come out of it because uh, there's, not very, there's not many opportunities when everyone thinks the same, more or less. In the school, there's no opportunity to do that. Uh, you know, outside of school, it's quite difficult. Like, both the family, both the school, and so on, are kind of helping this to happen because this is, this is how the system is built. And that is also why I think that it is very important to apply pressure from the outside. Now, I'm uh, just a bit concerned about, uh, about our hosts. Mm -hmm. I think it would be reasonable that they uh, got the opportunity to sell a drink to people. So I think what we'll do now is just take five minutes. Just take five minutes. You can refresh whatever you want to in the bar, and then we continue about half an hour. So we should try to be finished around 8.30, okay? It's five minutes now.
the floor. I saw one hand there when I was just proposing my, uh, this, uh, this break, so you have the floor. Marhaba, uh, Ronnie. Uh, as a Palestinian living in, in Norway, uh, I would like to welcome you here and there, <laughs> in Gaza also. <laughs> I am originally fra from uh, Jaffa, the house of my parents, still, uh, still up to this moment uh, there, standing there in, in Jaffa. They had uh, two children when they left uh, Jaffa, 1948. I am child number 11 and the youngest among their kids. Uh, I have heard you, much of, your, of what you have said, I expected to hear uh, actually. Uh, I would like also you, if you can speak a little bit about how is religion being used in the conflict? You are free to speak of how we use Islam in the conflict. How do you use uh, uh, Judaism uh, in the conflict? And how are people affected, so affected? It can be, uh, in my opinion, it can be one of the strongest uh, factors that drives people to believe what those crazy politicians want us to believe. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, yeah, before I was sort of just glossed over it. I said, yeah, you know, Zionism is anti-Jewish and that's it. So now let's elaborate. Um, thank you. I'm happy, happy that you're here. Um, so we have to remember, first of all, that before Zionism, in historic Palestine, you had Jews and Christians and Muslims and others living alongside with each other, Mabad, and uh, there was real coexistence before Zionism. Uh, also, sort of during <coughs> the Zionist uh, project in Palestine, there were still quite a few attempts at coexistence between some well-meaning Zionists, not many of them existed, but there were some, some well-meaning Zionists who wanted to come over for their reasons, for their Zionist reasons, but they wanted to live alongside the indigenous people. Not at the expense of, but that ended at the latest in 1948, probably before, but I'm giving the benefit of the doubt. It ended the moment that the indigenous people were kicked out of their homes and denied the right to ever come back. Now, Zionism in itself, was not about religion. The early Zionist, Herzl included, of course, the founder of Zionism, uh, I mentioned before that it is a nationalistic, even ultra-nationalistic movement that was uh, initiated as a response to anti-Semitism in Europe. Basically, the Zionists wanted to be a part of the European society and they felt that they are not being accepted, they are being discriminated against and, and there was all sorts of anti-Semitic uh, sentiment against them. But the early uh, attempts by Herzl to resolve that problem was simply, he, and he wrote it down, I'm not just sort of making it up, he offered that simply everyone will convert to Christianity and problem solved. And he said, we don't have to be shy about it, we have to go publicly and to organize a big event, a festive event, and we should all convert to Christianity and then we will be like them and uh, no reason for anti-Semitism anymore. So I'm saying it first of all to show how Zionism did not start as anything to do with Judaism. They didn't care about converting to another religion. Nothing problem, by the way, with converting to Christianity, but they didn't care about the religion. Um, secondly, once this didn't sort of, this was probably ridiculed by uh, many of Herzl's uh, colleagues, uh, so what transformed later was to say, okay, we want to be part of this, but they don't want us. They treat us as being different, so we must be different. So we are different. So we have to have a place for, for ours, for our people, because we are different. We cannot live side by side with them, with the other Europeans. Now, I can quote to you from other 
people of the Jewish community, leaders of the Jewish community, for example, uh, some guy in London who was a leader of the community, who wrote to Rothschild, and he explained to him, he said that those Zionists who want to live uh, separate from the rest of the world, separate from other Europeans, and they say we are special, we need to have a space for our special group, and we can never interact, we can never live alongside the others, uh, they are uh, manifesting, they are basically uh, speaking the same language of the anti-Semites. He said, it's bad enough when I have this coming from anti-Semitic people that I am fighting against. It's worse when it is coming from the Zionists, this anti-Semitic attitude. And he said it even better. I don't remember the quote by heart, but, uh, and it's not the only quote. There are many such quotes. Um, so I would argue that Zionism was a counter-reaction to anti-Semitism that to this day thrives off, lives off anti-Semitism and needs to perpetuate anti-Semitism in order to justify itself because they are not Jews, definitely not religious Jews. For religious Jews, there is no question of identity. Their identity is, is their religion, or their religious identity is their religion. Their national identity is whichever country they lived in. Judaism has absolutely nothing to do with the nationalism. Judaism as a religion has nothing to do with nationalism. So there was no conflict between being a religious Jew and living in whichever country it was. The Zionists, they came up with something else. They came up with Jewish nationalism. Never existed before Zionism. But the Zionists came up with this thing about Jewish nationalism. Obviously, they were not religious. They are secular Jews who are nationalists, but they still feel somehow Jewish, and they use this Jewishness of theirs, whatever that means, because they are not religious Jews. They use this Jewishness to justify this nationalistic uh, aspirations of theirs. So they implemented a nationalistic uh, project in Palestine using and abusing Judaism to justify their, their uh, cause. And they have, go both going to back to Herzl and others, other Zionists, they said that we should cooperate with anti-Semites in Europe and so on because we share the same interests. They also acknowledged that. Also, Lord Balfour, Balfour, who before, uh, like, right, um, almost 100 years ago, uh, which, which gave his uh, sort of seal of approval to, creation, to creating uh, the Zionist state or the so-called Jewish state, he himself was an anti-Semite. So, so this is one thing about Zionism versus Judaism. Secondly, many Jews, religious, especially ultra-Orthodox Jews, see Zionism as the greatest threat to them because Zionism was not only content with uh, um, saying we are, a, we are special and different and we have to establish our own state. They also were interested in driving away religious Jews from their religion. So Zionism, and, and because they, they justify it by saying, by speaking on behalf of Jews, there were, until, until World War II, basically, Zionism was far from being a success story. Only uh, about 5%, I think, of European Jews supported Zionism, and close to 0% among them were uh, religious Jews. During World War II, or during that period, things changed dramatically. But it, was, it wasn't a big success story until then. And, and the religious Jews uh, were staunch anti-Zionists because for them it's not just that they are not nationalists, also because they saw that Zionism was literally going against their religion. The Zionists come and claim to speak on behalf of Jews. And the more time progressed, they, they did it even more and more. Even the name Israel, that's a Jewish term. They, took over that and made it into a nationalistic thing. All the symbols uh, that Israel uses and so on. It's all those secular people who claim to speak on behalf of Jews. So that's one thing I have to say. Another thing that relates to today is that to this day, whenever any Israeli official uh, speaks, first of all, when Netanyahu, for example, 
uh, is being asked about uh, negotiating with Palestinians. He says, well, I will negotiate with the Palestinians if they recognize Israel's uh, right as a Jewish state. I don't recognize Israel as a Jewish state because it's not Jewish by religion, it's Jewish by ethnicity, by supremacy. No state has a right to be a supremacist state. Israel is only Jewish in the same way that South Africa was white. Not by religion, by supremacy. If about, about the, the religious aspect, we can, uh, you know, uh, we can argue and so on, but I, I, can, I can even prove that Israel has uh, very little or nothing to do with Jewish religion. When they say we are a Jewish state, they don't mean by religion. The majority of Israelis, by the way, they are secular. Um, when they say we're a Jewish state, they mean we need to have a Jewish majority. That's basically what they are saying. And that's basically what I was referring to before as this is a no-no, I'm not accepting that. And neither should uh, any Palestinian accept that or any, or any other person in the world. The other thing that those Israeli representatives are doing, and I will end here, the other thing that those Israeli representati representatives are doing is they say if you are critical of the state of Israel, what they call the Jewish state. Unfortunately, much of the mainstream media regurgitates this propaganda, saying, calling Israel the Jewish state, even though, as I said, it's not Jewish, neither Jewish nor democratic. They say, if you are critical of the state of Israel, you must also be anti-Semitic. You must also be against Jews. That in itself is a very racist statement because the logic of that statement also says the opposite. Meaning, someone who is Jewish, like myself, doesn't matter by religion or otherwise, someone who is Jewish must also be supportive of the criminal occupying apartheid state. That's what they are saying. If you are critical of Israel, you must be also anti-Semitic. Hence, the same logic says, if you are Jewish, you must also be supportive of occupation and apartheid. So, so the very statement that they are saying that they are trying to connect between Zionism and Judaism is racist in itself, saying all Jews are supportive of the state of Israel, and if you are against the state of Israel, you are against all Jews. So we have to negate it in its totality. Besides being very racist, they are also, they are actually, pro like I said before, they are the ones who are promoting anti-Semitism, because once they are uh, insisting that there is no difference between Zionism and Judaism, then people in the world who see the atrocities that Israel is, is responsible for, and Israel all the time claims that there is no difference between Zionism and Judaism, and that they speak on behalf of all Jews, if people don't like what Israel is doing, basically, and they believe the Israeli propaganda, they will also think that they should be against Jews because that's what Israel is telling us. So Israel is in, in fact fermenting anti-Semitism. But, but the very statement in itself is racist when they say, if you are against Israel, you must also be anti-Semitic. I'm totally against any connection between Judaism and Zionism. Uh, Ingebret, you have asked for the floor, and then there will be room for one more after. And I see two have already asked for that. So you'll get a half floor each. Uh. <laughs> well, uh, the University of Stavanger has a cooperation agreement with the university in Israel, the Technion University. And uh, we know that uh, this uh, university in Israel is uh, especially into the <coughs> military cluster. And this is also one of our, our, our arguments against this agreement. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about this uh, Israeli university? Yes. Um, so the BDS campaign in the B element, the boycott, there is boycott of consumer, uh, consumer boycott, but there's also a cultural and academic boycott as part of that. I will just uh, elaborate about the academic boycott to make it clear, but it also holds for the cultural boycott. There is no boycott against all Israeli academics. Actually, we don't boycott any Israeli academic. The academic boycott does not go against academic freedom. There is no problem for academics here to collaborate with academics in Israel, including in the Technion. No problem with joint research. 
what the academic boycott is calling for is for the severance of ties, for the cutting of ties between the institution here and the complicit institution in Israel. Why? Because every single Israeli academic institution is complicit in crime. I will give you uh, a few examples and then we'll talk about the Technion. Uh, two universities in Israel have a military base on campus. That includes the Hebrew University and the Haifa University. You have courses which are specifically for military personnel and Shin Bet personnel. You have funding coming from the Ministry of Defense, research funding coming from the Ministry of Defense, quite a lot of funding actually. You have facilities which are done alongside with the army. For example, a facility in the Hebrew University for medical, uh, uh, military medicine, which is in collaboration with the uh, medical department and the Israeli army, and on and on. There's many such examples. The Technion specifically, which is the Institute for Technology also in Haifa, they actually don't even ha try to hide their cooperation with the army and with the arms manufacturers. While other universities are a little shy about it, the Technion is getting their students by boasting about it. They say, come, study with us, and you will be at the forefront developing weapons, developing uh, you know, the security industry of Israel. So you can, I can send you some very interesting stuff about how they boast about their collaboration with Elbit, with um, IA, uh, um, IAI, the Israel Air, uh, Aerospace Industry, all these different, uh, uh, basically, weapons manufacturers. That is one thing that the Technion clearly does. They have, for example, a manufactured a, a, a remote-controlled bulldozer, a D9, a remote-controlled D9, uh, to not only that they are using D9s like these huge uh, um, bulldozers to, to basically to flatten uh, houses in Gaza, for example, uh, also the bulldozer that ran over Rachel Corey, the American activist, but now they have a remote-controlled one developed at the Technion in close cooperation with the army, of course. Uh, they have, uh, I, I can elaborate, there's much uh, such, such um, projects that are being done. Secondly, there is a relatively new campus of the Technion that is in Tel Aviv, and it is just bordering the command and control center in Tel Aviv. The command and control center, which is where the ministry of uh, the prime minister's offices and so on, is uh, right at the heart of civilian society, civilian life. It's, it's near the museum and the hospital and so on, and also near the Technion uh, campus. And that Technion campus has many students coming directly from the army, just crossing the street to the campus. And one of the courses that they are teaching there is military export. That's what the Technion does in Tel Aviv. And again, they boast about it. So I can send you some very interesting information about that. So at least about the Technion, I can say that they are not shy about it, so it's quite easy to, so, to show how complicit they are. Other than that, there's also other examples of just how they are um, discriminating, for example, racist against, uh, in the dormitories, they are discriminating between uh, uh, Jewish and non-Jewish uh, students and things like that. That's also documented. But it's enough what they do with relation to the military, the, the, the um, weapons manufacturers and so on to, to make the case here. You will, now <coughs> you will now get two questions. First you and then finally Andy. I come from the Quakers of Stavanger. We have a 200 year tradition in this town and we're also represented in Ramallah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, I'm curious about to what extent are Palestinian religious institutions coming on board in the BDS movement? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for coming here to fight for the Palestinian cause. Thank you for uh, coming as well. Because uh, most of the Israelis we meet, they are most of them soldiers. We meet some soldiers who have jumped off and coming to tell us what they are do have been doing in Hebron and now ever elsewhere. So that is the other way, and you are the third one. There are more, but not very many. So thank you for coming, and it always surprises me that there's, we meet so many uh, organizations trying to uh, 
work for Palestine, solidarity with Palestine, and sometimes you wonder, why don't we succeed? And when we speak about the BID, I think that is a very good uh, way of fighting. And I'm happy that the PALCOM here in Stavanger will have that as one of the, the hard uh, working areas mm -hmm. in the time because we also have this technical and uh, this cooperation and the, uh, the, the cooperation with Israeli uh, military weapons and so on. And, and uh, when we speak about religion, I think we shouldn't only speak about the Zionists, but also the Christian Zionists, mm -hmm. because we have strong forces in Christian Zionists in our country. And I think they are almost worse than the real Zionists because they are fighting for their life. They only hear they are fighting for the when Jesus yeah. came back, when all the Jews have left, and also in America. And this, is, uh, uh, this is, seems to me to be a very hard fight. And I think when we are fighting for the Palestinian cause and for the Palestinians to be free and to have the uh, human rights for them as well as for everybody else in the world, I think we are also speaking about releasing the uh, Israeli. I never sp say Jewish because that is Jewish mm -hmm. is everywhere, it's a religion. But the Israeli, people because actually it is it is it is it must be a prison for them to be uh, to be forced into this uh, brutality when you look at these young boys being soldiers in Jerusalem handling the uh, the young Palestinians the way they do it's really it's really what shall i say it's dehumanizing so they really destroy themselves and I think we should release both the Palestinians and the Israeli in this fight. Thank you. So I think that most people in this part of the world forget that there are also Christian Palestinians. So we have to remember that Palestinians are not only Muslim, there's also uh, Christian. Everyone knows about Bethlehem, of course. Um, and. Uh, we can make the religious case for why support Palestine, both from the Jewish angle, the Christian, and the Muslim. Uh, I usually don't go into that uh, because I don't want to make it into a religious issue. It's not a religious conflict. The Zionists would like us to believe that this is a religious conflict, but it is not. For them, they would like us to believe that it is anything other than what it is. A religious conflict, a clash of civilizations, um, anything but a very clear example of occupier and occupied, apartheid people, people under apartheid, colonizers colonized. As simple as that. So, at the same time, when I'm saying that, it is true that religious organizations play a very important role here important role in struggling for Palestinian rights. So first, I obviously have to mention the Kairos document, the Kairos-Palestine document, that I suggest uh, obviously uh, following, um, reading, uh, distributing, and so on. It makes the religious case, the Christian case, for why support Palestinian rights. Um, Religious groups, uh, at least in the US, I don't know what is happening here in Norway, I'll be happy to learn more about it. Religious groups uh, in the US have been very active in the past uh, few years in uh, different divestment uh, decisions, motions that they have passed. Uh, some with greater success, some with lesser success, but they have all managed very large uh, religious Christian and other uh, religious groups have passed very important uh, divestment and other resolutions, including the Methodist Church, the, the I'm sorry, I forget all the different names, uh, all the different denominations, but all the, many of the very big uh, groups have done that. This has obviously a financial impact, but more than that, it's the moral impact here. And we need this. We need these uh, religious figures, we need these relig religious institutions just as much as we need uh, other uh, people who, who carry a moral weight to use that, to, to, you know, with the privilege also comes responsibility. Being the privileged, it means that I also carry more responsibility. 
to speak up and to oppose that horrible system that I live under. It's not I cannot be um, apathetic or whatever, kind of in, indifferent about it. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Now about about uh, about Muslim organizations. Um, I don't know if I have much to say about uh, Muslim organizations that have uh, taken a stand one way or another. Um, I will have to find out. I don't have uh, anything uh, uh, specific about it. I'm, I'm talking about, obviously, not... Uh, maybe you can help me. I don't know if you know uh, some more about Muslim organizations and not individuals. Obviously, individuals, mu Muslim leaders, have definitely taken a stand for Palestinian rights and so on. That's obvious. I don't know about uh, large organizations that have done that. Uh, but obviously, in general, we know that, for example, every Ramadan, uh, there is uh, always um, uh, some sort of a campaign taking place around the world uh, asking uh, Muslim people don't purchase dates uh, which are usually sold a lot during the Ramadan. Uh, you know, those dates that are coming from the Jordan Valley, which are literally grown at the expense of drying up uh, Palestinian water resources and denying water from Palestinians living there. So they are asking, you know, please do not buy dates that are grown in Israel and so on, and don't support, uh, don't support that. That's what I have to say. I mean, um, I, I I just think that we have to promote as much as we can religious organizations to take a stand, not to be complacent and not to not to say kind of not to. If you are part of a religious uh, group. I would simply urge you to to use whatever other groups have already done. They have created very good documents and they made very good statements and go back to the Kairos document, of course, in order to push different motions, resolutions, in order to at least take a, a moral stand in, in the right direction. About uh, Israelis who are... Um, more or less conscientious and uh, and uh, oppose Israeli crimes. I will say that some of those, for example, soldiers who have been doing all sorts of things in Hebron and then they have a need to talk about it. If we are specifically talking about an organization called Breaking the Silence, I am very much opposed to Breaking the Silence. I am very critical of them, extremely critical of them. Okay, um, I, the short version goes like this. Breaking the silence does the exact opposite of the breaking of silence. They receive testimonies about some of which are about minor crimes, but some of which are about serious war crimes, like the using of white phosphorus in Gaza. They also corroborate the testimonies, so they get it at least from two different sources, and they have all the facts in order to make sure that this is indeed a valid testimony and not just made up. But they have never published a single testimony in their life. What they publish are self-censored stories where they have the information, but they have removed every piece of factual data. So it goes like somewhere, sometime, something happened. A real story, a true story, an important story, but without facts. Which the idea behind it is we need to speak to the Israeli public, we need to convince the Israeli public that they are doing, that, they are, that the Israeli ar army is doing bad things. But they are not seeking accountability. They are not seeking justice. They're also not doing what I would expect any decent human being to do if they have information about war crimes, at least to submit that information, uh, at least for the sake of the victims and their families. So I demand of them, they can do whatever they want with the Israeli public, I don't care. I don't have hopes of the Israeli public to do the right thing, to come to senses, but I don't care what they do with the Israeli public. But if they have information about serious war crimes, I demand that they publish it. Whether they like it or not is irrelevant in my, in my view. So if they have information, I demand that they publish it. What they do is they are sitting on a trove of information and they will never publish it. So if you have WikiLeaks on one hand that is all about revealing the information, you have breaking the silence on the other hand which is all about concealing the information.
Yeah. So, so you know, they're doing some good work, like for example, taking people on uh, tours of Hebron. I have no problem with that. What I do have a problem with is that element that they are concealing information. If they didn't conceal the information, I would only have a political issue with them. The moment that they conceal the information, I have another issue with them. So, so in any case, I would simply go back to the questions of Palestinian rights. Are you supporting of the end of the occupation? Are you supporting of equality? Are you supporting of the right of return? If you're supporting of that, okay, we have a common ground. If you're supporting of only ending the occupation, but you're still working very much towards the rest, towards perpetuating the other crimes, then I would challenge them about it. So I'm not saying don't cooperate with them, but, but be wary of that type of cooperation. <clears throat> this has been a very exciting night, very, very interesting, and uh, has been, been uh, really uh, been nice to listening to you. Not nice, not, not really nice. <laughs> <coughs> it's disturbing, uh, very much disturbing, and, and uh, uh, but still, I mean, we, you really gave us good information, and I get this kind of reference in my own head to uh, th those three movies w which were called Back to the Future. Secular democratic state. That's back to the future. So it's it's uh, it's really interesting uh, that we had this discussion, and uh, we are very grateful for your presence here. We wish you all the best in your courageous work for peace and justice in Palestine, and for Israelis, for Palestinians, whatever. Right. Thank you very much. Give him a big hand. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to end on a positive note so you don't, you know, walk out depressed. There is a lot of change happening. You know, there is really, I, the situation is horrible, but there is a change happening. So I think that we have to be optimistic that we can change it and we are showing that it is possible to change it against all odds or against the powers at be. The ones at the top are not doing what they are supposed to do, but we are able to change it and it is happening. So please join in. That's very good. Thank you. Uh, a bit in Norwegian to, to end this. Uh, Palestina komiteen tror jeg har en del forsalg ved utgangen. Te, skjorter, og det er litt forskjellige ting der. Uh, veldig fine ting. Ja, altså det er gratis publik brosjyrer og sånn. Og så er det altså forsalg uh, en del fine ting. Uh, og så vil jeg gjerne informere neste uke. Onsdag om seks dager, og på Sting, men en etasje opp. Da inviterer Nablusforeningen til en fin oppfølger, Andi, tenker jeg, i forhold til denne kvelden. Eh, har da, Nablusforeningen har jo arbeidet med vennskapsrelasjoner mellom Stavanger og Nablus nå i 2-33 år. Eh, vi skal på onsdag ha besøk av en av våre viktigste kontaktpersoner i Nablus, Nasir Arafat. Arkitekt, han har vært her i Stavanger ti ganger, eller noe sånt, tror jeg. Det er for mange ganger. Han er en skikkelig Stavanger-venn. Men denne gangen har vi utfordret han til å holde et lite foredrag om å, rett og slett, hva er situasjonen i Palestina sånn som det er nå. Han skal ikke holde et politisk foredrag, men mer et sånn perspektiv som, som en som er aktiv i, i det palestinske sivilsamfunnet. Eh, hva er situasjonen i Palestina nå? Det blir altså klokka sju onsdag den 2. november her på Sting om seks dager. Så velkommen tilbake da, og takk for i kveld.